everyone. Thank you for joining us online here at Destiny. If you haven't had a chance to visit our campus, we would love for you to come out and join us for our 1030 service. But if you can't, you can always watch us online at destinyokc.com. And while you're there, you can watch any of our past messages, see any of our upcoming events, or read pastor's blogs. Also, don't forget to follow us on all of our social media platforms right here. And now, here's this week's message. I really uh, just felt one thing that was really important for us to understand. I keep hearing this phrase as I'm just in a time of prayer and, and thinking about what the Lord's trying to do in all of our hearts in this hour of the church. And it is um, our worship causes our world to flourish. If you just think about coming into a, a mindset of worship, you know, um, I, I just have learned in my own house when I have to do a dish that isn't mine, or has anyone ever had injustice in the house hit you upside the head before? In those moments, uh, I can, uh, you know, be frustrated with a person who left a dish, or I can actually let that be a sacrificial expression of worship to the Lord that I don't even t tell them about. I mean, I know there's something of teaching responsibility, but at the same time, there's also something of worship where I learn I don't always just have to, you know, make my case known. And sometimes that's a beautiful fragrance to the Lord. And what that does is it fosters something of an awareness of, of serving and loving and caring and giving. So our worship makes our world flourish. Um, worship to the Lord in my marriage, you know, if I can just learn to love Tracy the way Jesus wants me to love her without all the strings attached. Uh, does anybody here ever love your spouse or maybe a close friend and you, you, you love them with certain expectations? Has that ever happened before? And so those expectations better be met. I mean, it's just like that's not worship to the Lord. That's keeping the, the score. And um, I, just, I know that the Lord wants us to learn the value of, of worship as a way of life. And in doing so, it causes our world to flourish. So um, it's a beautiful expression for us as a church. We had various meetings going on this morning, and I was kind of popping in and out of those meetings. It was beautiful to have uh, people come pass through baptismal waters today. Come on, let's just celebrate one more time. New life. What an exciting celebration that is. Just going deeper. And so I was in a meeting where there was some conversation and, and interaction there. I was in a, a meeting where there's some conversation about a financial community group that's going to be starting this fall to help people. Uh, we're just believing for some supernatural assistance to take place in the realm of personal finance in your lives as family. How many of you believe that's a good idea? So we just agree for supernatural advancement. But what is happening, those families that are in there praying into and talking about this, they're doing it as an act of worship to the Lord. And what that does then is make the world they live in flourish. Uh, tonight, we're going to have a great time of just celebrating. And um, I know the weather is suspect. Uh, in the original Hebrew, that is Oklahoma. <laughs> So don't worry about it. We are, uh, we are very aware of and capable of moving things inside that have to be outside. It'll be amazing to shoot off those fireworks right in this room. <laughs> Except the fireworks. But they're saying like if there is some uh, rain, it'll be leaving by 9. And 9.30 would be the dark um, point for when the fireworks would happen out in the football field. But um, the Cornhill Tournament, all that, I mean, we can arrange and we can have, of course, the Cafe Anderson concert in here. But, but the, the point I'm making, all of this stuff doesn't just happen. It happens because we as a church family have come together now for more than 25 years to do this the last Sunday in June, by the way. I don't know if you realize. I think this is our 28th year to do this. And the community knows that we're the fireworks church. I have people say, oh, you're the pastor of that fireworks church. And so uh, we're the fireworks church. The last Sunday in June, we always celebrate our freedom and we give thanks to God that we live in a nation where we can freely serve Jesus and lift up his name. It's a beautiful celebration. But what happens, uh, we come together and make all this happen. We fund parts of what's taking place, and we, we man booths and all that. We do it, why? 
out of worship to the Lord. And worship makes our world flourish. So I just want to encourage you, explore an act of worship as a way of life. Uh, during worship, uh, as we're singing, there are communion tables back here. It's a beautiful way, just during worship. Sometimes we'll have communion all together, but you can make your way back and uh, just have communion while we're in that time. It's a beautiful, beautiful expression. Giving stations are at the back. It's a great time for you to give, to bring tithe and offering. Again, that's how we do the things that we do. We helped a family this last week that was just in an incredibly difficult situation. We do that because our worship causes our world to flourish. So be faithful with your giving. That's why tithing has always been a part of God's plan for worship. Always, all through the Old Testament. Jesus endorsed it in the New Testament. Uh, don't let anybody tell you anything other. Do this out of a heart of worshiping the Lord so you can give in those giving stations or you can give online, uh, however you'd like to do that. But I believe our, our worship really does cause our world to flourish. I know uh, we're going to spend some time going deeper in the Word soon. And uh, I appreciate A.T. Hargrave and his, um, his gift of teaching in the church as one of our uh, pastors of our executive team. And um, I'm, I'm sure glad Kristen makes him come to church all the time. <laughs> but, um, but he's going to be starting a class soon, and that's going to be talking about what it is to live awake and engaged. And we'll be doing that on Wednesday nights. And that's coming, I want to make sure I say the date correct, July the 10th, that will begin. It'll be right here in the upstairs. And um, if you're interested in baptism, if you're interested in a class, if you're interested in the finance, I just want to remind you, as an act of worship, fill out a Connect card, drop it in one of our giving stations, and as an act of worship, we'll respond and do our best to love you well. And as an act of worship, we will all become more who God's called us to become as a family, the expression of God our Father to the earth. Isn't that beautiful to think about how this works? And as an act of worship right now, I just want to break bread in the Word. As an act of worship, I don't want to get up and try and impress people. But as an act of worship, I want the Lord to be pleased with our moments together. As an act of worship, I want our hearts to receive His Word. So would you just invite him to help you as he helps us all in these moments that we have. Lord, we are desiring to understand more of what it is to serve the king of all kings of the right side up kingdom in this upside down world. So Lord, would you open your word and show us things today that would be more than just a little positive speech but there will be impartation from heaven in every single one of our hearts that empowers us to live a life as an expression of worship to the Lord our God that will actually be transforming to the world around us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Right side up kingdom in an upside down world. Today, uh, uh, we're going to recap a little bit of what we talked about last week in terms of Ecclesia, and I want to tie in one more piece to that as we start to understand who, who Jesus says we are as the church. And then I want us to understand the importance of right-side-up language. You are called to live in, on behalf of the Lord in a right-side-up mindset, as an expression of the right-side-up kingdom in an upside-down world, having right-side-up language. I'm going to talk to you today about, um, let, let's just go through this and make sure we're all in agreement. How many of you would agree with me, Jesus is God? Yes. Everybody say amen if you believe that. And do you know what Jesus is doing right now? According to Hebrews chapter 7, he's seated at the right hand of the Father, Jesus is God, ever living to make intercession. Jesus is God. Jesus is praying. Why does God pray? I don't think we understand prayer. And I believe the Lord wants to help us see something today. Because prayer is not powerless people praying to a powerful God begging for something to happen. Prayer is actually empowered people who know who they are releasing something of substance to the world around us. We are part of this right side up kingdom. So we'll get to that in a few moments. But let's first start to get 
a little bit of an understanding once again. Jesus uh, has this encounter with Peter, and Peter, uh, he says, who do you say I am? To the disciples, Peter then jumps up. Um, anybody here have uh, that, that mindset? You're, you're the first to raise your hand. You're ready to answer a question. You don't care if you get it wrong. You just like being apart, right? That tends to be me. Um, and, and I get it wrong a lot because I, I rush to it sometimes. But I can relate to this character that we read about in Scripture. And so Peter immediately says, well, I'll tell you who I say you are. You're the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. And the disciples had to have leaned in because that would have been blasphemous had it been wrong. And Jesus, as a rabbi, would have been obligated to actually smack him in the mouth for blasphemy. That would have been very common cultural response to a wrong answer of that type of magnitude. But what did he say? Peter, you're the rock. And on this rock, what rock? He said, flesh and blood, by the way, he said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. In other words, you got a revelation of Christ from God your Father, and that is changing the way you think. That is the rock upon which I'm going to build my church. You and I must have a revelation of Christ from our Heavenly Father that changes the way we think. That is the rock upon which Jesus is still today building His church. Everybody say church. We use church as a religious term. This was not a religious term. There were religious entities in Jesus' day. There was the temple. He didn't use the word temple. There was the synagogue. He didn't use the word synagogue. He actually chose a secular term, not just secular. It is a military term, and we looked at this last week. So let me just reiterate, he used the word ecclesia. Ecclesia was a very understood term in the disciples' day. In Rome, they were under the oppression of Roman authority. And when Rome would go in and conquer a territory, they would send a delegate, of assembly of delegates that were the expression of Rome to go into the conquered territory and represent the emperor and all authority of Rome in that uh, fallen, uh, conquered territory. That's what the ecclesia was. It was a military term. Jesus said, on this rock of revelation where you get a revelation from the Father of who Christ is and it begins to change the way you're thinking, you think, you then will become my delegated assembly, my ecclesia, my church that goes into the conquered territory. How many of you know Jesus came and conquered in the earth? We are in conquered earth. Jesus is the more than conquering king. And we are here to have a revelation of Christ that changes the way we think and it expresses out of who we are to begin to transform the world around us to become the kingdom of God. Jesus wasn't trying to perform some type of rescue operation to get people out of earth into heaven, which is what a lot of escapism theology is today. Can I just tell you, you are are wrong theologically if you are coming to the conclusion, well... The world's just going to hell in a handbasket. It's going to get so bad until finally there's just very little hope at all. And Jesus comes and rescues that little bitty hope out of the earth. That is not biblical. Biblical is the body of Christ starts to be a strong bride of Christ. She starts walking in the grace and the power of God Almighty. Everywhere we go, something's emanating of God's kingdom out of us. We're the ecclesia. This is a military declaration. Jesus didn't come to perform a rescue operation to get us out. Jesus came to to release heaven into earth and he said when you pray say my kingdom come my will be done on earth as it is in heaven this is who we are yeah your applause is releasing something of heaven in earth right now do you understand your worship will cause your world to flourish will you engage your heart just for about 60 seconds and really release something out of heaven come on let's worship the Lord with a hand clap of praise and a declaration we are here our transformed lives are proof that Jesus is king and this military operation of God's kingdom advancing in the earth is happening through us We are the church. We're the Jesus movement of our generation. 
This is the ecclesia. According to Roman law, when just two or three people would go into a conquered territory and they would be there in representation of Rome, it was as if the Roman emperor himself were there in this conquered territory. This is Matthew 16 when he's saying on this rock I'll build my church. Then two chapters later, Jesus said, if just two or three of you are gathered in my name, it's not as if I am there. I am there in the midst of you. Like that Roman authority and jurisdiction was powerful. Nothing compared to the power of the true king of all kings. He's not, it's not as if he's there. He is here right now. He's here. This is crazy because it goes on. And, and what I didn't get to last week, and I'm trying to get through today, there's way more of this on the blog, destinyokc.com. Just go and, and, and rehearse some of these things. Let, let God reveal things to you in this. Because not only did Jesus use a military term to describe the church, ecclesia, he also used a military term to describe leaders of the church. Now, these are all terms that we would call religious terms in our day because we've allowed them to become that, but that's not what Jesus was saying. When Jesus' learners, the disciples, were ready to become leaders, what did he call them? Apostles. The word apostle was a word the disciples knew because they were under the oppressive regime of Rome. Apostle was a term in Rome that was used to describe generals that would lead ecclesia into conquered territory. This is Roman terminology that Jesus was rescuing, redeeming, restoring, and saying this is not about an emperor in Rome and power. He stood before Pilate, and he had nothing to say because he had nothing to prove. He knew who he was. True authority of eternity exists within us through the blood of Jesus Christ as he died on the cross that you and I might enter into that state of humility and out of vulnerability comes power. You have to be vulnerable if you're going to be powerful. You have to be humble before the Lord and allow him to have his way. So even the term apostles, what we would use in five-fold ministry, which we'll be talking about later in the year, what that all looks like in terms of a gifted life. All of us have gifts. But Jesus was using these terms specifically, strategically, and purposefully because he was not coming to establish a religion. Jesus came to establish a kingdom. The kingdom of God is at hand. You and I are citizens of the kingdom of heaven with a purposed assignment in a conquered territory of this fallen world. You and I, we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven with a purposed assignment in the conquered territory of this fallen world. And as we get a revelation of our conquering king from our heavenly father, Jesus begins to establish his church and expand his work and the kingdom footprint begins to be established even more so in the earth. Okay, that's a foundation for me to be able to bring what I feel like I'm supposed to bring, that we need to be on the same page to understand. We are here to take over, folks. I actually had somebody one time years ago, they came to me after and they said, you know, we just can't stay anymore. We're, we're going to have to leave the church. And I said, well, I understand. We're, we're not a church that's for everybody and everybody has a place. Find your place, you know, go and like not offended. And they said, don't you want to know why we're leaving? I said, Sure. And they said, you seem militant. <laughs> That's what they said. And they, they wanted me to be like Jesus, an effeminate sheep stroker that just tells everybody everything is beautiful and there are no problems that you have to address into it. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. Why did he say such a thing? Yes, he loved the poor. Yes, he was compassionate. Yes, he was gracious. Yes, people were drawn to him. But he was unbending when it came to the reality of truth. And they didn't crucify him because he was good to the poor. They crucified him because he was politically incorrect. And in a 
political climate that we're in, you and I need to understand the importance of standing with a backbone for what God's Word says. You don't get to decide what, what is right and wrong for you. You don't get to do that. The Word of God defines what is right and what is wrong. You submit to it or you don't. So here's Jesus, God, at the right hand of the Father, Hebrews 7, 25, ever living to make intercession. Why does God pray? Adam and Eve sinned. We all agree with that? This is why we have to be saved. This is why we have to be rescued. This is why Jesus had to come as the second Adam to redeem and restore humanity because Adam and Eve sinned. And, and God said to Adam, when you sin, like if you eat the fruit, you die. How many of you know he ate the fruit? But didn't look like he died. He's still standing there talking. But he died. He didn't die physically yet, but a physical death was initiated and began to be a progression of death that did not exist prior to that. He died spiritually immediately. And then there began to be this entropy reality of a diminishing of the energy that actually God started all of the earth with. The second law of thermodynamics is the law of entropy. The law of entropy simply says everything is winding down. Nothing is winding up, regardless of what your evolutionary conversations may be. Nothing winds up. It all winds down. This is scientific law. I'm not even talking theology now. I'm just talking scientific law. If the theory of evolution violates the law of biogenesis, Genesis and the law of entropy, then only the deeply confused would adhere to a theory that violates the scientific law. This is just a reality. I know God can do anything, and I, and I don't you know, question that. And so there may be some people who believe God actually made all that happen, then that, you know, whatever, whatever you want to believe. But I believe in the Big Bang Theory. I believe God spoke, bang, it all came to pass. But the law of entropy is the scientific law that says everything is winding down. Now, God spoke the world into existence. If we go to the origin of all existence, we find this, this power, this energy that came from God. In fact, what we read about in Genesis chapter 1, just go ahead and turn there, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, just where it all begins. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God did it. God made it. It happened because God brought it to pass. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. The, the theological train of thought here is God created it. He didn't create it formless and void. But after verse 1 was the revolt of Lucifer in heaven. He was cast down to the earth and chaos then erupted in the earth. And then we read verse 2 where darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over waters. And God said, what did he say? Let there be light, and there was light. What did it look like? It looked like darkness. What did he do? He didn't rehearse the darkness. He began to declare the light. I want to say to you, stop rehearsing the darkness of your situation and start declaring the light no matter what the situation may look like. You actually have the authority and jurisdiction as the apostolic ecclesia to carry this weighted authority from God Almighty in the earth where your words have power. This is not just powerless us hoping powerful Father will do it. It's all contingent on Him, don't get me wrong. But there's something you and I carry that we release with our words when we pray in accordance with God's will, according to God's Word. This is what Jesus is doing, making intercession at the right hand of the Father. He's perpetuating and releasing something of the original source of energy that started it all. And if we don't wind up these winding down entities, then everything will fall completely apart socially, in the community, in your marriage, in your friendship, with your car, with your house. How many of you know you've got to inject energy in these winding down entities or they're going to fall apart? This is the power of prayer. I know this will sound crazy, but it is an intercessory act when I kiss my wife. It is an expression of winding up something in our relationship that otherwise begins to fall apart. 
It is an act of intercession. This is why our worship causes our world to flourish. Husbands, kiss your wives. Wives, kiss your husbands. Like it's a beautiful thing. Marriages will flourish if we'll invest selflessly in the way we serve and care for and foster this affectionate relationship. This is injecting energy in the marriage relationship. You inject energy in the friendship relationship. You inject energy in the car by taking it to get it maintenance. You inject energy in your teeth by going to the dentist. Do you get the principle? It's winding down, but you and I are actually empowered by God to stir it up. But we have to stop rehearsing the darkness, cooperating with the wind-down mentality, and start declaring the light, cooperating with the rise-up mentality. You are mighty men and women of God. You're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath. God came to deliver you out of the bondages that the enemy's trying to keep you stuck in, and you're free. Come on. I'm a little stirred up. We are the apostolic ecclesia. The military expression of the kingdom of heaven. And our king is an unconquerable, unconquered and unconquerable king. And your children, who may not be serving God, can actually be called into a disposition where their hearts melt before God Almighty by the power of your prayers. My father was not serving God. My mom and I began fasting and praying. Friday was fasting and prayer day. We fasted and we prayed and we believed God and we believed God and we came back. We weren't even in the same city, but we were interacting with each other and we were fasting and praying. We were saying, God, would you capture his heart? How many know God's able to capture a person's heart? Because he's sitting right over here and he gave his life to Christ and now we're serving the Lord as a family. Let me just tell you, it ain't all, it ain't all hunky-dory. You still got issues to walk through, but I'm thankful we're going to spend eternity in heaven together. And I believe you and I have something that we can pray into existence in the hearts of our family. You and your house will be saved. This is the Bible. This is the script that actually sets the tone for the kingdom of God to be manifest in the earth through the sons and daughters of God when we start to understand we are the apostolic ecclesia in the earth. We're created in the image of God who releases his creative, redeeming, restoring power through his word. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 tells us, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Isaiah chapter, 50, uh, sorry, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 2 says, God has made my mouth like a sharp sword. That means when I pick up God's word and I start to declare his truth and his words get in my mouth, my mouth becomes like a sharp sword of God's word, piercing the darkness, penetrating the chaos, declaring that which is reversing or that which is declining and going down and into greater chaos suddenly begins to reverse and rise up and become more of what God designed it to be in the first place. Jesus isn't powerlessly praying to a powerful father. Jesus is declaring God's word, releasing God's power in waves across the earth. This is why hearts begin to be awakened. The Bible says you couldn't come to Christ alone. You can't come to him unless the father draw you. It's the prayers of our high priest cooperating with the prayers of the priesthood in the earth that softened your heart in the first place so that you then could come alive, out of death to life, out of darkness to light. You start to understand and comprehend God is mightily at work and drawing you in. Jesus is there declaring these waves of grace and this power being released into the atmosphere of the world and his word will not return void, Isaiah 55, but it will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. Will you allow God to put his words in your mouth so your mouth becomes like a sharp two-edged sword? Will you begin to pray and believe God? I, I, I believe this is important for us to just... Some people need to repent of negativity. There, there, there are 
thermometers that tell us what the temperature is in the room, and there are thermostats that set the tone for what the temperature is about to become. Stop being a thermometer and start being a thermostat. This is what God's called us to be. Uh, D.L. Moody wrote 100 names of his friends that he wanted to come to Christ. 95 of his friends that he prayed for on that list came to know Jesus before he died. How many know that's an A plus? 95 is a good score. But it gets even better. The five remaining attended his funeral and gave their lives to Christ the day he died. I think that's important. You and I aren't just supposed to, you know, hope as if, like, there's no substance. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. There's substance to our hope. We're to strategically get involved. When we pray, we release the substance of God's kingdom into the earth to replenish, restore, and even reverse the curse into a blessing. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 2 says, God reverses the curse into a blessing. That's our role in a place of intercession and prayer. Stop giving up on the world. If you're a candidate, do you even have a candidate in, in, today's, in today's world? It's just crazy, isn't it? If your candidate doesn't get elected, if, if politically it doesn't go your way, if the stock market does something, if, if, if something doesn't line up with what you think it ought to be, then it's just like, it's too easy for us just to come to some resolve, well, the world just not, you know, just there's no hope. It's just nonsense. You, you heard the story of Nineveh? Like they used to fillet people live that wouldn't agree with what they believed. Like nobody wanted to go to Nineveh and challenge anything they had to say, but God told Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. And like it was a big deal for Jonah. That's why Jonah didn't go to Nineveh. He ran off the wrong direction because he didn't want to be filleted alive. I mean, if you, I don't blame him. And so he said, no, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go this way. And you know the story. It didn't work out so well. And, and, and he wound up going to Nineveh. And when he finally, listen, when the man of God came into alignment with his assignment, the pagan, the capital city of paganism turned to God in one single day. I just want you to understand the problem in our world is not the abundance of darkness. The problem in our world is the absence of light. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. That does not say in Chronicles, it doesn't say if all the bad people will stop being so bad, if everybody just vote right, if everybody stop doing drugs, if everybody stop being pimps and prostitutes and all the things that the world's full of, whatever it is, you know, that, that's our, our ax to grind in any given moment in time. I want you to know God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond through this apostolic ecclesia that begins to understand we're not the salt of the church, we're the salt of the world. We're not the light of the church, we're the light of the world. <laughs> the world's waiting for you to figure out who you are. And when you do, things will begin to change. Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. Was Jesus confused? No, he was inviting you, you into an office of authority as a part of the apostolic ecclesia that carries the jurisdiction of a kingdom more powerful than Rome, of a kingdom more powerful than any kingdom that has ever existed in this world. You embody that. This is why Smith Wigglesworth would come into a, a church that was waiting for him to come and preach. And, and history tells us that when he came into the church, suddenly he would walk in the back door. Nobody knew he was there, but because he carried such a weighty presence from God that a hush would come over the room before they even realized what was going on. A sense of God's presence will change and create an awe in the lives of those around us when we learn to carry his presence in such a way. We're really carrying the apostolic ecclesia anointing God desires for us to carry.
Father, I believe I've spoken what you've asked me to say. I ask that you would awaken your word within us. That we would understand we are part of a right side up kingdom. It has a right side up language in an upside down world. Would you penetrate our hearts, Lord? Would you convict us in a loving and beautiful way, the way you, only you can do, where we would repent for our negativity, we would repent for cooperating and collaborating with darkness and negative circumstances, and that's just the way it is, that's the way it's always been, that's just the way my daddy was, that's just the way I am. Forgive us, Lord, for negativity for the misappropriation of the powerful resource of our voice when we step into an attitude of complaining, when you've actually called us to use the resource of our voice to reverse the things we tend to complain about. If you need to repent for negativity, then just stand to your feet. And just break this off, Lord. We break this spirit of negativity, the rehearsing of the darkness, rather than the proclamation of light. And we say, Lord, would you help us to become the people you've called us to become? Help us to have a revelation of what this apostolic ecclesia really is all about, this militant movement, the Jesus movement of our generation where you're awakening something by the power of your spirit and the reality of your word that exists within us so that something can come from us that actually born from the origin of heaven rather than born from the origin of hell or of this earth and this world. We are not those who perpetuate chaos, confusion, and darkness. We are those who perpetuate eternity and light. And we surrender, Lord. We surrender our hearts. We surrender our minds. Teach us this week, I pray, Lord, to renew our minds to the reality of your word, a greater sensitivity to your spirit, a bolder declaration of your reality. In Jesus' mighty name, Come on, let's all just stand to our feet. You know, God's Word always comes with an assignment. I'm convinced of that. We're told, don't just be hearers of the Word. Be doers. This is why we, every week, want to make sure we communicate some form of expression that we can come around together as a church how we bring God's presence to real life our worship team sorry Joe will go ahead and come Um, that's why every week we want to bring some action point you know that GP2 RL that's what that means that's just the core of who we are you hear me say that phrase all the time you and I are called and anointed by God to bring God's presence to our real life world everywhere we go. It's beautiful. When we show up, He is there. And so your action point this week, I just want to ask you, every morning when you wake up, don't say, good Lord, it's morning. (laughs) Say, good morning, Lord. Just change it a little bit. You know, we, this, Tracy and I were having this conversation. There are morning people and there are night people. And I understand. Our disposition is such that some people are slower to smile in the morning and quicker to frown at night. Uh, you know, you start drooping, not frown like, you know, you grow depressed, but just, you start getting, you know. I, I'm a, I'm a, I get, I, I, I've always said early morning prayer begins the night before, so I always make sure I'm going to bed early enough 
to be awake early in the morning. See, I'm a morning guy. I'm crazy in the morning. You don't want to be around me if you're, if you're not a morning person. I will frustrate you like you can't believe. <laughs> so regardless, so, so what that means for me is I tend to get grumpy in the evening. Some people tend to get grumpy in the morning. I just want to ask you to assault the grumpiness. So in, in the morning, just declare, this is a good day. Every morning you wake up, I want you to wake up and let the first words out of your mouth be an intercessory declaration that I am part of the apostolic ecclesia called by God to be living in this world, waking up at this hour. I didn't set my alarm. I got up too early. Maybe the Lord wants to have a conversation with you. Stop complaining about it. Stop misappropriating the resource of your voice by complaining when he's actually called you to pray. Just put it into practice. Every morning when you wake up, start declaring, this is a good day. I just bless my day. I bless my morning. I bless my afternoon. It's a good day. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. God's favor is on my life. Everywhere I go, I'm going to lean into the grace and the favor. I'm going to watch for grace and follow favor and just lean into what I sense the Lord. It's a good day. This is a wonderful day. It's a great day to be alive. And every night, whenever you're going to bed, I want you just to begin to say, just those declarations that we find in the Word, when you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Tonight, as I lie and I'm in sleep, uh, though my body will be asleep, my spirit will be alive. I'll be interacting and communing with God. Do you know that you can commune with God all night long if you'll just learn to put this into practice in your own mind and heart? That's why Jesus in the Word of God says, pray how without ceasing. Communion with God is something that happens all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They stirred, in the Old Testament, they stirred the coals in the morning and they stirred the coals in the evening. And incense would rise 24 hours a day because they stirred it in the morning and they stirred it at night. And the Bible says that the incense is like the prayers of the saint. It ought to just be constantly coming out of you. You stir it in the morning and you stir it at night. Let incense arise. That's the way we're singing that song. When we sing that song, something coming out of me that's alive by my spirit. I tell you, this is one of those moments I feel <laughs> ridiculous right now, like in an amazing way. I feel an open heaven so profound right now. And I just want to share that with you. I want to ask you, would you just receive that? We're going to take a few moments in worship, and there's an open heaven in the room. Would you just receive what God desires to release in your heart? He's going to enlarge and awaken things within you. We've repented for negativity. Let me just tell you, you can't conquer negativity on your own. You've got to go to the cross of Jesus Christ. He's got to rescue you from your sin. He's got to redeem you out of that pit, take you out of darkness into light. Otherwise, you'll just keep on rehearsing darkness. So I just say to everyone here, everyone online, if you, I, I'm serious, if you're alone online in, in a room right now, then I want to ask you to do this very thing. But anybody here that says, I acknowledge Jesus is who he says he is, I assume that's us, then I want to recognize he died on the cross. I want you to lift your hands and surrender. We just recognize, Jesus, you are who you say you are. You're the Savior of the world. You believe that? Say amen. amen. You came, you lived, and you died. You redeemed all of humanity that is willing to confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. And Lord, we just receive that we are the apostolic ecclesia. We are awakened by the Spirit of God to carry the fire and the power of eternity in a way that's beyond our wildest imagination. Would you wake that up within every single one of us and teach us your ways as we walk, Lord, in the ways of God by the Spirit of God. If that's your prayer, say amen. Come on, will you take your words and let's bring worship to the Lord our God just for a few moments before we're dismissed. Come on, with all of our hearts, let's worship this King.